And good evening. We are live and you are watching the Trinity Channel. My name is Chris Palmer and this evening I am going to be your debate moderator. We have a wonderful two hours of broadcast ready for you. So we want you to stay tuned, get comfortable and allow us to bring to you two hours of nonstop debate between our two guests that are here this evening. But before I introduce them, I want to let you know that this is live. So we are going to be taking callers at 5.30 p.m. So I want you to hold your questions until 5.30. If you have to, write them down, jot them down. There should be a number at the bottom of your screen. And at 5.30, call in and you can ask questions to any of those who are part of our debate today and they'll be happy to answer them for you. So with that, let's go ahead and introduce to you those that will be part of our debate. First, we have Sheikh um, Karim Abu Zaid. Sheikh is the Director of Religious Affairs at Al Minhal Academy in South Jersey and is spearheading the construction of Colorado Muslims Community Center. Sheikh Karim is a PhD candidate in Islamic studies with the American Open University from Cairo, Egypt. His love and passion of teaching Islam has led to his founding the Tessir Quran. As well as Sheikh, he will be debated by Dr. Tony Costa. Dr. Costa has earned a BA and an MA in the study of religion, biblical studies, and philosophy from the University of Toronto. He received his PhD in the area of theology and New Testament studies from Radboud University in the Netherlands. He's a member of the Society of Biblical Literature, the Evangelical Theological Society, and the Evangelical uh, Philosophical Society. He also served as an adjunct professor with the Heritage College and Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario, and Providence Theological Seminary in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and lectures across Canada, the United States, as well as overseas. Gentlemen, we welcome you to the Trinity Channel and our ABN headquarters tonight. Welcome to our show. Thank we want to go ahead and begin uh, our debate with our Sheikh. Sheikh, our topic tonight is the crucifixion of Jesus, fact or fiction. And so we want you to go ahead and make your opening statement. Opening statements will last for seven minutes, and then we'll allow your opponent to come and rebuttal. Jake, go ahead. Welcome. Uh, before I begin, Chris, so I was debating a couple of days ago, uh, and uh, I was promised the debate would only be for one and a half hour. And it went over that. So uh, you mentioned two hours. I'm fine with that, but not even a second over that because of uh, my commitments, please. I have appointments I have to attend to. Is that okay with you? Two hours, Ruby. Uh, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. All praise are due to Allah, the glorified, the exalted. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of my worship and submission except Allah, the glorified, the exalted. And I bear witness that Jesus, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. Uh, I welcome the viewers. Uh, I welcome uh, 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 Costa, uh, Tony Costa, Professor Costa, Dr. Costa. I'm sorry, I, I missed whatever it is. I, I have high regard and respect for you. Uh, Chris, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, let's have uh, uh, a good conversation on the subject of uh, crucifixion. Uh, first of all, I do realize the sensitivity of the subject for a Christian because uh, like uh, Paul uh, mentioned in uh, Corinthians, I think that's the book, that if there is no crucifixion, uh, then, um, you know, there is no Christianity, basically, because uh, Christianity is founded on the dogma of uh, the fact that God the Incarnate uh, died for the sins of humanity. Um, 
So I do understand uh, your position quite well, uh, and the fact that you can't even uh, compromise an inch. Uh, uh, meanwhile, our position is the same exact thing. It's actually uh, a belief system. Uh, it's a, a component of our faith uh, that we believe firmly without any shadow of doubt. Uh, in this verse, uh, number four, uh, chapter 4, verse number 50, 157 and 58, and what follows it. Uh, قتلو, they killed him not. Look, look at this affirmative uh, format. صلبوه, they crucified him not. لهم, but it, it was made to appear so to them, meaning uh, 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 there was a crucifixion. Uh, Muslims, by the way, we don't cancel out the event of crucifixion. We believe that there was a crucifixion, but Jesus was not touched. He was not put on the cross. Uh, rather, uh, someone who had his uh, similitude or his resemblance uh, was placed uh, in his, uh, 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 instead of him, basically. Um, and actually, the Quran tells us uh, that you yourself, uh, are uh, formulating that uh, belief on conjunctures. Uh, and if you look at the word conjunctures, the formation of, opini of an opinion uh, without uh, uh, authentic or sufficient evidence. And if we really explore uh, uh, the facts that you have, uh, they are conjunctions. Uh, we normally hear the uh, argument that uh, Muslims are uh, coming a thousand uh, uh, miles away, Muhammad came a thousand uh, miles uh, uh, from Jerusalem and uh, 600 years later and coming and saying that did not take place. Actually, if we go back to your uh, history, we find out that uh, earlier groups refuted the uh, alleged crucifixion of Jesus, peace be upon him. And uh, hopefully I will be able uh, to do uh, uh, present some of these as I go. So really Muslims were not the first who actually, uh, the uh, uh, apostle of, 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 of Peter, Botrus, Peter, uh, actually uh, believes in the theory of substitution. So uh, the notion that Muslims were the first to come up with this is wrong and is, is very uh, de 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 deceiving uh, to the people. We should not be saying that because he had earlier groups uh, really uh, spoke about this. Uh, 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 his history uh, being a historic fact, Josephus and Tacitus. We know Tacitus was a Roman uh, historian. Uh, if you look at his uh, book that he wrote years later, uh, you find out that he's describing Christian and Jews to be worshippers of a god who has a head of a donkey, and he doesn't even know what's going on. Um, it has been established that what Josephus, the uh, Jewish historian, wrote, uh, that it was actually added to uh, his uh, book of history by the Christian. So uh, it was not established by him. But even if it is true, we still have to debate who was on the cross. Well, you see, we believe that there was somebody on the cross. We, we, don't say, we, don't say, we don't refute that. We don't say that. We say that uh, crucifixion took place. But Jesus was not uh, touched. Um, of course, uh, you know, I, you may be uh, surprised, uh, uh, Brother Costa here, that uh, you find me talking about um, Paul. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, but Paul is the one who introduced all these uh, simply um, the, all the, all that theology, invented theology, being uh, uh, influenced by the uh, Gentile, which is really another term for pagan worship. Um, the concept of uh, the original sin, the Son of God the trinity, the divinity of Jesus, and the alleged crucifixion of Jesus are pure inventions of uh, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is what I will explain also throughout uh, my presentation, uh, uh, Again, uh, I want to uh, uh, invite uh, ourselves to be sensitive. Uh, Muslims, uh, this is a belief matter, a belief system. Uh, Jesus was not touched. For you, likewise. So let's look into the facts and find out. And I uh, invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cast lights into the hearts 
and minds of those who are watching so that they could see the truth uh, uh, ta'ala. Uh, a good will uh, Dr. Kasta and I hope you're a, a doctor I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm not trying to uh, I'm going to give you those 15 seconds as a gift uh, to you. Thank you. Dr. Costa, go ahead. The Trinity Channel for hosting uh, this debate and also for you, uh, brother. And uh, thank you, uh, Sheikh um, Kareem. It's an honor to be with you on this uh, program. And I trust that this will be the beginning of a, of a long friendship between us. In dealing with the question of the death of Jesus or the crucifixion of Jesus, I'm not going to address immediately uh, Sheikh uh, Kareem's uh, arguments because that will be part of the rebuttal period. But I want to present um, the facts. Now, I do appreciate um, uh, Sheikh Kareem said we should look at the facts, and I agree with them. We should look at the facts about this question. In order to ascertain about the question of the death of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus, we're dealing with a historical question, and of course, also a theological question. When we deal with a historical person, we have to look at the historical documents. And the question, of course, arises, what are the earliest documents that we have historically for the historical Jesus? Every scholar in the field, in academia, scholars in biblical studies and religion and so forth agree that the New Testament documents are the earliest documents for us about the life of the historical Jesus. They are from the first century, they come from the time period of Jesus, of the eyewitnesses, those who followed him, those who heard him, and so forth. The other thing we also have to bear in mind is we have to place Jesus within his framework, that is his historical context. Jesus of Nazareth was a Mediterranean Jew who lived in the first century, who was raised in the faith of Judaism, and who also adhered to the sanctity of the Holy Scriptures, namely the Hebrew Bible. And so if we're going to understand Jesus, we need to go to the earliest sources. And what are the earliest sources? They are the New Testament documents, particularly the Gospels. Now, the death of Jesus is without question the most pivotal uh, fact of history that we know concerning him. And so scholars like Bart Ehrman, like John Dominic Crossan, Robert Funk, even the most liberal scholars will admit that the one indisputable fact we have about Jesus is that he died by crucifixion. There is no historian that I know of who denies the crucifixion unless he denies that Jesus actually existed. But let's go to the earliest documents and see what they say. If we go to the Gospel of Mark, which a number of scholars believe to be the earliest gospel, there are three places I want to read to you where Jesus actually predicts his death. So the first passage comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, verse 31. And it says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Now, if this appears again in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 34. They're on their way up to Jerusalem. We're told that Jesus, leading the way, said to his disciples, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit upon him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise again. And then in Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Close quote. Now, what is interesting about these statements, of course, is that Jesus, being a Jew of the first century, understood that the Hebrew Scriptures spoke about one who was to come, who would be the Messiah, who would be the Redeemer, and the Savior of his people. The concept of atonement was also central to Judaism, not to Islam, but to Judaism, the concept of sacrifice, the temple, atonement, and so forth, were central facets of the Jewish faith. And this is why Jesus, as a Jew, understood this concept. He understood himself as the Messiah, Al-Masi, who was spoken of by the prophets, and this quote from Mark 10:45 that he would give his life as a ransom is a reference to Isaiah chapter 53, where the suffering servant of Yahweh is going to pour out his life as a guilt offering for the sins of his people. And so what we have to understand is that the early eyewitnesses, and I'll say a little bit about this in the rebuttal period, the famous Muslim uh, commentator Al-Razi, placed a lot of importance on the concept of eyewitness testimony 
and the passing of vital eyewitness testimony to others. And so the New Testament documents, the Gospels, the letters, the book of Revelation, and so forth, all of these texts point out that the death of Jesus is central, that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what the text says. Now, the other point is that when we look at the name of Jesus himself, the name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, and it comes from the Hebrew Yehoshua, which is the longer form, and comes to us in the Greek Jesus. And the name Jesus, or Yeshua, literally means he shall save. And so what did Jesus come to do? Well, he came to save his people from their sins. The Bible is very clear on this, that men and women are sinners. They need to reconcile with God. And the prophets spoke about a Messiah who would come, who would make intercession, who would make atonement for the people to be reconciled with God. And so the question of the death of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, is really in academic circles, it's a no-brainer. The only people who denied the crucifixion of Jesus was the Gnostics in the second century. And the reason why the Gnostics said that Jesus was not on the cross, he was not placed on the cross, was because the Gnostics didn't believe that Jesus was an actual human being. The Gnostics believed that Jesus was a spirit guide who was sent by the Cassidy, true, you have one minute, sir. And he was sent by the true God to reveal secret knowledge and so forth. So the only people who denied the death of Jesus were actually the Gnostics. Uh, those who denied his humanity. And the death of Jesus is corroborated even by the enemies of, of the early Christians. It's also corroborated by, by Tacitus, by Suetonius. Josephus mentions it as well. And we also have reference to it in the Jewish Talmud. And so the idea of the crucifixion of Jesus is firmly planted within history. And the onus, of course, is on uh, our brother, Sheikh uh, Karim, to show otherwise. So the onus and the burden of proof uh, does not lie with the Christian. The onus and the burden of proof lies with uh, the Muslim uh, uh, apologist and so forth. So the death of Jesus is definitely a firmly fixed fact of history. There is no scholar who would deny it unless he denies Jesus existed. Thank you. Jake, you have five minutes for your rebuttal. Uh, first of all, uh, no eyewitness. I heard you saying that eyewitness. There was no eye eyewitness. All these historians existed years later after the alleged crucifixion. And they based their compilation of such a thing. If we agree that Josephus, uh, Josephus uh, uh, because Tacitus, that that is, we, we don't really trust the dude because he doesn't even know uh, that to, how to differentiate between Christianity and Judaism uh, and what kind of a god they worship. Uh, we still disagree on the character who was put on the cross. So number one, the notion that they were eyewitnesses is wrong. And I think it's very deceiving uh, that you're saying that. Uh, all the Gospels, the four Gospels that you're referring to, were written years after the alleged crucifixion. And they were not even written by the names uh, attached to them. And I think it's very deceiving, Dr. Costa, to say that, because you know that. The first gospel written was Mark and 50 years, almost 54 years later on. So why don't you spell these things out that there were no eyewitnesses? Here is what happened, sir. Um, let's approach the subject from theology. If we look at Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus is the one that we believe in in Islam and the one who was believed in, in Judaism. Is the one who came to worship God, the one who came to direct people to the worship of God, the one who came and said, I did not come to abolish the laws, but to fulfill them. Your salvation, whoever uh, uh, obey the commands, he will be called great in the kingdom of God. He is commanding people to follow the laws. Uh, that is, Jesus is. What happened is the 13th self-claimed disciple who never met Jesus in his life, and he came up with a story that he saw Jesus in a vision, and he ended up introducing all this theology being influenced by the paganism that spread out there because he felt like he needs to spread that religion amongst the Gentiles. Therefore, he had to compromise. Now, we need to understand that Paul had a great impact on Christianity. 
14 out of the 27 books are written by Paul. Who is Paul? He did not even meet Jesus in his life. He never, actually he was killing his, uh, his followers. You, you, you agree to that? He was actually dragging some people to kill them. So, uh, uh, he is the one who introduced all that theology. And his 14 books, I, I believe there is a debate over the 14th, his 13 books were the first books placed in the New Testament. Now, the so-called writers, writers, we wouldn't even know them, because really it used to be the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according, this is in, in Arabic, you know, we have a form in, in, in the science of Hadith, Ruya, Sirat Tamrid, that we don't even know who wrote it. These individuals who wrote these gospels were already, uh, Mark, Luke, and, and John, the, the, the one that can tell us actually about the life of Jesus, the theology of Jesus, were already influenced and affected by these corrupt concepts, and I'm sorry to use the word, corrupt concepts. Why they are corrupt? Because they don't rhyme with the Old Testament, and I can sit here and show you evidence that salvation is in the worship of one God and observing of the law. Paul came and canceled this out. He said, no, there is no, not, nothing more that called law. What you have to do? You have to do that. You brought Allah, God, from the throne down to earth, and we placed him on the cross. We killed him for our own sins. So he came out of the norm here. So you, quoting, you have one minute left. You quoting all these nice texts, it is okay. I will quote for you similar text. You see, they divide the uh, the new testament into jewish theology and this is not my talk this is written by james bokers i think a documentary in, in the book of the Trumani. said jewish theology gentile theology the gentile theology is paul now jewish theology would uh, uh, interpret the text that you're quoting to the viewers differently uh, uh, dr casta so what we're talking about here we're talking about somebody who invented these five concepts, the original sin, the Son of God, the alleged crucifixion of Jesus, the Trinity, and, uh, and the divinity of Jesus, and he had a great influence on the New Testament, even the writers of the other books, uh, the, 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 the 13 other books, were influenced by him. Thank you. Dr. Costa, you have five minutes to rebuttal. Yes, you will notice that uh, Sheikh Karim did not dispute the first century dating of the documents. He simply attacked the reputation of the authors and so forth. But uh, one of the things that Sheikh uh, Karim said was that if there was no crucifixion in 1 Corinthians 15, there'd be no Christianity. That's not true at all. If there was no resurrection, there'd be no Christianity at all. So the resurrection is one vindicates uh, the uh, mission of Jesus. Now, the other uh, problem here is that he went on to uh, say something about Tacitus. Tacitus comes to us, he wrote his Annals of Rome about the year 116, and he clearly mentions Jesus. He mentions the death of Jesus, and even mentions Pontius Pilate, the one who condemned him to death. Now, um, Karim, I think, is in grave error when he says that these texts were not written by eyewitnesses. All you have to do is go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Luke tells us that he interviewed the eyewitnesses. He went to the eyewitnesses, to those who were servants of the word, those who were ministers of the word, and he interviewed them. This is eyewitness testimony. John 19, John tells us that when the sight of Jesus was pierced on the cross, he says, he who saw this bears witness that this is true. And so John presents himself as an eyewitness to the event. And remember, Al-Razi said that the eyewitness testimony is of tremendous importance because if we cannot trust the eyewitness testimony, you cannot trust anything at all, even the prophethood of the prophets. Now, he uh, also didn't mention the fact that the biographies of Jesus come very early. They were written about 30 to 70 years after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. If you compare this to the biography of Muhammad, the earliest biography of Muhammad is attributed to Ibn Ashaq in the year 150, 150 years after Muhammad, but Ibn Ashaq's Sirah doesn't even exist. It has been edited by Ibn Hisham who comes 200 years after Muhammad. And then we have Al-Waqidi. Al-Waqidi wrote a biography about the, the battles of Muhammad, and that's 200 years after Muhammad. And so it's just interesting that uh, Sheikh Karim is willing to accept a biography that comes two centuries after the fact, and yet here we have first century documents that are written 30 to 70 years afterwards. Now, his attack on Paul is, is quite, uh, quite erroneous. 
The Apostle Paul was a Jew. He was a Torah-abiding Jew. The concept of Son of God, the concept of Son of Man, the concept of original sin are not Christian inventions. The idea of original sin is found in the Old Testament. It's found in the, in the Torah, in the Tanakh. It is found, for instance, in Jewish rabbinic literature, which clearly associates the sin of humanity with the first sin of Adam, and that the fall of Adam has affected all humanity. The Son of God language, I wrote an article on this on the AnsweringMuslims.com blog in two parts. The Son of God language is rooted in the, in the Old Testament. Excuse me. It's found uh, in Genesis 6, where it refers to the angels. Uh, the language of Son of God is is used of the uh, Messianic king in Psalm 2, verse 7, and so forth. The, the judges of Israel, the heavenly councils referred to as sons of God. The term son of God is used of the nation of Israel in Exodus 4.22, where Yahweh refers to Israel as my firstborn son. And also the Messiah is referred to as the son of God. So to say that Paul invented this is simply not true. It's absolutely erroneous to claim that. Most scholars regard the Apostle Paul as a bona fide witness. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, that he passed on to the Corinthians what he received. And this is clearly the language of transmission. What did he receive that he passed on? Well, he passed on a very ancient creed, and that creed is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4. And it says, Christ died for our sins. Dr. Costa, you have one minute, sir? He was buried, and he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. And this language is the language of transmission. The Apostle Paul did not make that up. That is information that Paul obtained uh, from the earliest disciples of Jesus, the Jerusalem Apostles, and he simply passed it on. In Philippians 2, we have what's called the Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ. And there, Paul talks about how Christ took on the form of a servant. He became a slave. And he became obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross, wherefore God has highly exalted him. Now, the problem with the Quran, of course, as I'm going to show in the next uh, rebuttal period, is that many Muslims have been in grave disagreement. Some Muslims actually believe that Jesus was crucified. Some of them even believe that Jesus died on the cross. But I'll wait until the second uh, rebuttal period to make that uh, assertion, and I'll back that up with some, uh, some sources. Thank you very much. We're going to go to a 60-second break. When we get back, we will hear from the Sheikh. Stay tuned, and we'll be back in just one moment. Live Arabic debate between Shant and Sheikh Basim al sharam The topic will be a cry from the furnace of religion. The debate will be held on Monday, March 7th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. GMT time. For more information, please call the numbers on the screen or visit our website at abnsad.com. You can now watch ABN in the Trinity channel on your iPhone and iPad. Search for ABN Sat in the App Store. You can watch all the following channels. The Arabic channel, the English Trinity channel, the Worship channel, the Surath channel, the Kurdish channel, the al Qudus channel, the Prayer Channel, and a special channel for Europe and the Middle East. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. And we are back with the Trinity Channel. If you're just tuning in with us this evening, we are having a debate between Dr. Tony Costa and Sheikh Ab uh, Ab Karim Abu Zayed. We're talking tonight on the crucifixion of Jesus, fact or fiction? We left off with the Sheikh. Sheikh, you have five minutes. Go ahead with your rebuttal. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, viewers. Uh, I think I'm taking the position of defending the teachings of Jesus here. And Dr. Costa is simply defending the teachings of St. Paul. I'm going to invite the viewers to tell me which one should I follow. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. I'm just going to read 17. Think not that I came to destroy the law. Or the prophets I am not coming to destroy but to fulfill them meaning and this is a very similar text that we have dr. Costa in our revelation confirming what came before me 
That is Jesus in Islam, is Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus in the Jewish theology, which stayed after his disciples. But the Gentile teachings, which was uh, propagated by Paul, here is an example. And you tell me which one should I follow? God will judge men's secret through Jesus Christ. Christ has ransomed us from the law in as much as he became a curse for us. The letters of Galatians 3.13. Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Paul confirms the, his position in Romans 4.6. Galatians 2.16, um, and Timothy, the first Timothy 1 to 9, Titus 3, 5. Uh, which one should I follow? Uh, you tell me, because you're really advocating for Paul, and I'm really advocating for the teachings of Jesus. Actually, Dr. Costa, dear viewers, we know that Paul disagreed with who? With Simon Peter. The word, the, the name Peter was given to him, and it means the rock. He said, this is the rock of my church. He disagreed with him. He actually said that when, Pe when Peter, the disciple, came to Antioch, I, meaning Paul, opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Galatians 2.11. So he actually fought with James, the brother of Jesus. He, he fought with John. What about Barnabas? Dear viewers, here is what is happening. Jesus came to confirm the teachings of Ibrahim, the teachings of Moses, of Moses, the teaching of David, that salvation lies in the belief in one true God. He's above his throne. He forgives the sins while he's in the heaven, like he has forgiven the sins of Adam. We believe that in the Quran. Adam received actually words from Allah teaching him how to repent and he repented and he came out of the sin so this what was revealed to Jesus to convey that the belief in one God is your salvation the worship of one God is your salvation and simply striving to do good when you commit a sin ask God ask Allah to forgive it for you this is the formula for salvation and this is what will save you now you ended up with Paul Someone who never met Jesus, St. Paul, who never even uh, encountered a lesson from him in his lifetime, he introduced all these concepts. And I'm sounding, repeating myself, but I'm reinforcing the fact that I'm really defending the teachings of Jesus. You are defending the teachings of Paul. Paul is somebody who invented the original sin, invented the uh, alleged crucifixion of Jesus, and by the way, uh, Dr. Kasta, Al-Fakhr al-Razi is a scholar who belongs to one school of thought called the Mu'tazila, and you know that quite well. So Thank you using, name, sir. using his name doesn't really impose any th anything on us, you know, as Muslims. Uh, scholars have the right to uh, explain the text any way that they want. We know what happened that day. Whatever Al-Fakhr al-Razi concludes, he is from the school of analogy, the school of intellect. Intellect takes precedence over divine. This is what you would call. He's not really, I'm not abiding by him. I'm abiding by the text that I have. What happened? Yes, they attempted to crucify Jesus. Peace be upon him. But God saved him. How? This is what I will explain to you. And I'm looking forward to you uh, refuting that verse. Because let's get to the subject. What happened that day? You know, I think it's important to find out what happened on that day. I don't think you know. You, you, you're basing everything on conjunctures. Why don't we go and visit Barnabas? Why don't we go and visit uh, uh, Toma? Why don't we go and, and visit Peter? They will tell you that someone was placed in place of Jesus on the cross. Dr. Thank Kasta. you. Five minutes. Uh, again, uh, we're talking about defending the teachings of Jesus. The earliest documents we have for Jesus are the New Testament, not the Quran that came 600 years later from a period where there was no, uh, there was no contact with uh, the Bible in terms of an Arabic Bible. Muhammad had no access to such a Bible. Now, uh, Sheikh Kareem says, I keep defending Paul. I'm not defending Paul. I'm defending the New Testament as a collection. Paul is one of those writers, but he's not the only writer. So the topic is the crucifixion. Now, he said, go ask Peter and Thomas 
about uh, that someone else was placed uh, on the cross. I don't know where he's getting that from because the New Testament simply says over and over again that Jesus died. This is not even debated in academia. This is a given fact of history. Now, um, Sheikh uh, quoted uh, 517 to 20, and I agree with that. Jesus came to fulfill the Law and the Prophets, and the Law and the Prophets is a reference to the Old Testament. And the Law and the Prophets are the Tanakh. It's the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus fulfilled those Scriptures. But uh, certainly, Sheikh uh, Karim does not follow the Law and the Prophets because does uh, Sheikh keep the Sabbath? Does he keep the seventh day holy? Does he keep the Jewish feasts? Does he follow the Jewish laws? Of course he does not. Uh, and so Jesus is talking about fulfilling these uh, commandments and these laws. Now, the, the other problem here is that he keeps attacking the Apostle Paul, but as, as David Winham and N.T. Wright and uh, J.R.S. Machen and many other scholars have shown, Paul is a faithful disciple of Jesus. He is taking the message that he received from the Jerusalem Apostles, and that message is that Christ, according to the Scriptures, was buried and was raised again. Now, what is interesting is that the Apostle Paul became a believer in Jesus about a year to three years at most, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And, and Sheikh Karim says, well, we can't trust Paul, but yet uh, Sheikh Karim is willing to accept the Hadith of Abu Khari and Hadith of Muslim that are written over 200 years after Muhammad. And so that simply just doesn't make any sense. If Paul is not a reliable source a year to three years after Jesus, how can Bukhari be a reliable source and, and, and keeping only less than 2% of the Hadith that he uh, believed were Sahih or sound and so forth? So once again, the idea that even the Muslim Jesus, if we look at even what Muslim scholars are saying, and I'd like to quote uh, Professor Tarif uh, Khalidi in his book, The Muslim Jesus, Harvard University Press. He says that the Quranic Jesus is in fact an argument addressed to his more wayward followers intended to convince the sincere and frighten the unrepentant. As such, he has little in common with the Jesus of the Gospels, canonical or apocryphal. Professor Khalidi also says that the Muslim Jesus is, and this is his quote, a Muslim creation. He is, quote, an artificial creation. And then he even goes in so far as to say that the Islamic Jesus is, quote, a fabrication and that he is metahistorical. What is Professor Khalidi saying? What he is saying here is that the Jesus of the Quran bears no resemblance to the historical Jesus. He is recast in an Islamic light. As, as the Muslim apologist Shabir Ali has said, the Quran takes the prophets of the Bible and recasts them into an Islamic light so that Jesus is a Muslim, Moses was a Muslim, Abraham was a Muslim, and Jesus is simply teaching what Muhammad taught, which is simply Islam and submission. But when we go to the historical documents, uh, the Quran quotes from very spurious sources. It has Jesus speaking from the cradle, Jesus making clay birds out of clay, uh, Jesus uh, causes a table to come down from heaven and, and there's food on it. Uh, all of these stories are recognized by scholarship to be apocryphal stories. They're not historical. They're not true. They're simply tall tales. And, and so the problem here One minute, is Dr. that Costa. look at the Muslim Jesus. The Muslim Jesus, as Professor Khalid um, has pointed out, is simply a Muslim invention. And so this is not the first century Jew. Uh, that we find in the New Testament. Jesus was a Jew who believed in the concept of atonement, and he said, I have come to lay down my life and to give it as a ransom for many. And when I come back, I will share with you another Muslim uh, commentator who believes uh, that uh, the concept of Jesus dying on the cross has been accepted by other Muslims. Sheikh, you have seven minutes to rebuttal. Uh, Dr. Costa, I, I would like to uh, thank you uh, for your presentation here. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, viewers. Uh, you making a comparison, you know quite well the science of hadith. I think you're a learned person and you know the science of hadith in Islam. You know how it's done. Uh, you cannot even compare your gospel to Bukhari and Muslim. You know, we know every single narrator where he lived. What is his name? How long did he live? What kind of a job did he do? Did he need that other narrator or not? When Al-Bukhari narrates hadith, he says, I heard this hadith from so, who heard it from so, who heard it from so. We know who's so and so and so and so. But all we have, the gospel according to Luke. Who is, who wrote that, when it was compiled. You making a, a, a comparison, I let this go with the biography of the Prophet. Please, come on. 
you, you know, don't, don't, come on, why don't you just state the truth to the people? You're a learned person. I am 100% positive that you know this. You're a learned person. I looked at your biography. You're a learned person. Share the truth with the people. Don't, don't try to tell them halfway through, please. That is not right. The issue of the Son of God, you mentioned this, uh, Dr. Costa. There are tons of sons of God in the Quran. Jacob was the son of God. Why Jesus is the son of God? Why he is the son with a capital S? Let me put it this way. Why all the other sons with a small S? Please answer this for me. Please. Now, I have a problem here. You know, when I want to follow the theology of Jesus, when I want to look at the life of Jesus, when I want to know who Jesus was, I'm not going to go after Paul. I know you're asking Sheikh Google, please, can you tell me without Sheikh Google, you know, look at this now. Paul had a fight with Barnabas. Barnabas is a disciple of Jesus. He lived with Jesus. And I'm referring to the Acts of Apostles. Please ask Sheikh uh, or Pastor Google, if you want to do that. Uh, the Acts of Apostles 15, 36, and 39. That is my reference. Which one should I believe about theology issue that he was promoting the dogma of the original sin he was promoting that jesus was crucified or for, for the sins of humanity he what they were fought over this okay what about he actually fought with simon peter remember dr costa jesus called him you are the rock of my church you're gonna be the rock of my, i'm gonna build my church on you jesus said that to him and uh, he fought with him, the letters to Galatians 2, 11 and 12. So which one should I go, please? I'm having a conflict here. Like I said, you may be able to produce other texts that may indicate um, harmony between them. Like I told you, the New Testament divides into Jewish theology, Gentile theology. Unfortunately, the Jewish theology it's taken out of context. And if I quote it to you, you're going to say, I, I took it out of context. And if I don't know my, my, my stuff quite well, you're going to say, no, that is not true. Now, the Gentile theology is what you're abrogating and what, is what you're teaching and what you're promoting. And unfortunately, this is Christianity as we speak right now. And this is why the Quran came, Islam came, to reinstate the facts. To, you see, uh, you tell me, uh, Dr. Kasta, uh, if, if you're going to use the, uh, the, the analogy that Muhammad was uh, a thousand uh, miles away, 600 years later, have you ever, I want to ask you this personal question, and please, Dr. Kasta, have you ever read the story of the birth of Jesus in the Quran? Have you ever read it in the Quran, in Surah Maryam and in Surah al Imran? You know, how in the world Muhammad would, you see, how in the world Muhammad would know about all these details? You tell me. It's very similar to what you have. Actually, we believe, we believe as Muslims that Jesus spoke as an infant in the cradle to defend the honor of his mother, that she did not commit adultery. She was a chaste woman. And also to defend monotheism. The first words which came out of the mouth of Jesus, the baby, peace be upon him, I am the slave of Allah. And this is, this is coincide with what he taught. You, you see, even in the New Testament, this is Jesus in the New Testament, the leftover of the Jewish theology, if I may say. Look what Jesus, what, what Jesus said in the, in, 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 the, in the, okay. He, Jesus, fell with his face to the ground and prostrated and prayed. Matthew 26, 36, Jesus said, I'm returning to my father and your father to my God and your God. This is Jesus in the Quran, Jesus, even in the New Testament, again, the leftover of the Jewish theology. Jesus, the prophet, people at the time of Jesus believed that he was a prophet. Matthew 21, 45, he was a prophet with a powerful word or powerful in words. Luke 24, 19, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. You, 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 you describe him, the Jesus of Nazarene, right? 21, 11, Matthew 21, 11. A man accredited by God. That is the Acts of Apostles 2, 12. So this is Jesus. Uh, Jesus not equal even to Allah. God says before me, no God was formed, nor will there one after me. I even, I am the Lord, and apart from me, there are no other saviors. Isaiah 43, 10. 
Jesus said, my God and your God. John 20, 16. Jesus taught his followers to follow the teachings. So this is who Jesus is. In the Quran, in the Old Testament, in the leftover Jewish, Jewish theology, by his disciples who fought, who fought the approach and the theology of St. Paul, which he started promoting around the, 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 the Gentiles. Um, uh, actually, sometimes uh, St. Paul would go to one of the cities. Uh, just read the uh, uh, Corinthians. And then later on, uh, the, the students of the, disi the, the disciples would come and teach otherwise. Who taught you this devi deviated theology? Who did this? Come on, Dr. Costa. Let's tell the people the truth tonight. You know, it has to do with their salvation, man. <laughs> it has to do with paradise. It has to do with hell. It has to do with going to paradise. Please, come on. Let's state these facts to the people. That's what I'm asking you to do. Jesus in the Quran is the, the same in the Old Testament, is the same in the leftover Jewish theology. We, you are debating and defending and protecting the Gentile theology, which is not true. Dr. Kassi, you have seven minutes to rebuttal. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, I think we're getting a bit off topic because the topic is the death of Jesus and we're, we're moving on to uh, the concept of who Jesus is and et cetera, et cetera, which is fine, but I think we have to stay on target. Now, a, a number of things that uh, Sheikh uh, Karim said that really surprised me. He said, there's tons of sons of God in the Quran, which is a shock to me because the Quran says that God has no son and that you're not to see as a son. Uh, Surah, uh, Surah Al-Maida 5 verse 18 says, the Jews and the Christians assert we are God's children and his beloved ones, say, why then does he punish you for your sins? No, you are but mortals, just like others he has created. So I'm actually surprised that, that Sheikh uh, Karim actually went against the Quran in asserting that there are sons of God in the Quran when the Quran says that we are not God's children and that to say that God has a son is to commit shark, the sin of associating partners with uh, God. Now, uh, again, um, what I've been saying here tonight, folks, if you check out the, the resources I've been alluding to, uh, Professor uh, Khalidi and so forth, I'm simply saying what academia has been saying for a long time. And that is that the biography of Muhammad is a two century later document. It cannot be trusted because we deal with the question of this huge time gap between when the biography is written and when the person who lived is supposed to be the subject of that biography. We don't have a problem with that with the gospel. The gospels are very early become within decades of Jesus. Now, um, um, Sheikh uh, uh, Karim was saying, well, we have this now. We know who said what and who said what, and he got it from this person. But how do you know that? You're simply taking uh, Bukhari's word for that or Muslim's word for that. And so there's a serious problem. No academic scholar would accept that as legitimate uh, uh, rules for uh, accuracy and transmission. Um, then he says the gospel according to Mark and Luke and John. Uh, I, uh, re uh, really, uh, Brother Kareem, you really, I think, have to seriously uh, take the New Testament, respect that text, give it the same respect that you expect Christians to give of the Quran. When it says the gospel according to Mark, it doesn't say this is Mark's uh, idea, this is Luke's idea, this is Matthew's idea. It's the one gospel. And the gospel is not a book. The Quran says the Injil was given to, to Jesus as a book, but the word gospel means good news. It's not a book. It's a message. And the message is that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised again, according to the scriptures. The concept of original sin, again, Brother Kareem, the concept of original sin was not invented by Paul. It is found in the Old Testament. Psalm 51, verse 4, uh, David says, in sin I was conceived. My mother brought me forth in iniquity. The concept of original sin was already believed in by the Jews prior to Jesus. And if you want to talk about Peter, Peter did teach that Jesus died on the cross. If you read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says that Jesus Christ himself bore our sins on the tree. He died for us. By his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. 1 Peter 2, 24 is very clear that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Now, you make a false dichotomy when you talk about Jewish theology versus Gentile theology. I don't know where you're getting this Gentile theology from. Gentiles were pagans. They didn't believe in the one God. They were not monotheists. The Apostle Paul was a monotheist. He believed in one God, just like Peter did and John did and Jesus did and so forth. So I don't think you're up to, uh, to speed on what scholarship is saying today. The Apostle Paul was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the followers of the most strictest forms of Judaism 
known as the Pharisees. And so I really think you have to really reassess uh, your position on this. Now, have I read the birth story of Jesus in the Quran in Surah Maryam, in Surah 19? Yes, I have. And that Surah is simply borrowing from other sources that we knew about. So Mary gives birth to Jesus under a palm tree. Well, in the Bible, Jesus isn't born in a, under a palm tree. He's in Bethlehem. We know where he went. He went to Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem, most likely in a cave or a stable. But the Quran has Jesus being born under a palm tree. And then he speaks from the cradle. Well, where does this come from? Brother Kareem, uh, read the pseudo gospel of Matthew in that document, which is pre-Islam, pre-Quran. It mentions the same story. Mary goes to a palm tree. She goes into labor pains. She gives birth to her son, Jesus. And Jesus speaks in a water stream comes forth, the tree bows down to give her some dates so she could eat and so forth. This is why in Surah 25, uh, in the first few verses, the, the, the unbeliever said to Muhammad, there's nothing new here, Muhammad. We've heard all this before. These are stories of the ancients. We've heard this before. What are you bringing that's new? And so, yes, I've read Surah 19, and the story is just simply a borrowed story from other sources that existed. If you want to know about the birth of Jesus, go to the first century documents to Matthew and Luke chapters 1 and 2. Now, the other thing that I found quite interesting is that when Jesus spoke from the cradle, did you know, uh, Brother Kareem, that uh, that story appeared in the infancy gospel of Thomas long before Muhammad was born? In other words, these stories are not new. They've been around before Muhammad. That's why the people kept saying, Muhammad, this is nothing new. We've heard this before. And it makes it worse because if you believe the Quran was written in the Umar Kitab, in the tablet in heaven, it even becomes even worse because these stories don't come from, from, uh, from Muhammad or from Allah. They come from uh, stories from peoples that existed prior to Muhammad. Now, I was delighted, uh, Brother Kareem, to hear you quote I John 20. One minute and then we'll cut I was delighted right to one minute. quote John 20, where you said, Jesus says, I ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. And I appreciate the fact that you acknowledge that Jesus did regard God as his father, that he was my father and he is your father. And so I'm willing to ask uh, Brother Kareem, are you admitting now that Jesus Christ was God's son and that he did say those very words, that Jesus did say my father and your father? Because if he said those words, then we have a major problem with the Quran. The death of Jesus is very well established, both in the New Testament and the early centuries of the church. And so we're still waiting to hear uh, who were these people who denied that Jesus died? Who were these people who said that a substitute was on the cross? Because if that is the case, then we got, uh, we, you've, you've got a case. But who are these people? Could you please elaborate who denied the death of Jesus that someone else was placed on the cross? Thank you. We're going to go ahead and jump to a 60-second break. I want you to stay tuned. But before we jump to that break, I want to remind you, that at 5.30, we're going to go ahead and allow viewers to call in with their questions. If you have a question for the Sheikh, if you have a question for uh, Dr. Costa, you can call in at any time after 5.30, ask your questions, or just hold off until then. At 6 p.m., we're going to have a follow-up show with Ismail Namir and Tony Garul. So we want to remind you to stay tuned after the show as we come back with our follow-up show. We have a 60-second break, and then we'll begin again with the Sheikh. Stay tuned, you're watching the Trinity Channel. Live Arabic debate between Shant and Sheikh Basim al Sharaf. The topic will be a cry from the furnace of religion. The debate will be held on Monday, March 7th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. GMT time. For more information, please call the numbers on the screen or visit our website at abnsad.com. To our viewers all over the world, you can watch us by satellite through the following frequencies. For North America and Canada, please join us on the Galaxy 19 satellite, frequency 11966 horizontal. For Europe and Middle East, join us on the Hotbird satellite, Frequency 12111 vertical. For Australia and New Zealand, please join us on the Optus 2 satellite. Frequency 12546 vertical. 
For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. And we are live here at the ABN headquarters. You're watching the Trinity Channel tonight. We're in a debate with our, uh, two of our guests, and they're speaking on the topic, the crucifixion, fact or fiction. We left off with Sheikh Kareem. Sheikh, just want to remind you to stay on our topic, which is the crucifixion, fact or fiction. You have five minutes. Go ahead. What do you mean, uh, uh, stay on the topic? You see... Everything is connected, Chris. Come on, you cannot deny that. Crucifixion is a result of original sin, atonement. It's all together. What do you mean? You're talking to who here? You see, Jesus died on the cross, according to you, because there was an original sin, because you deny the forgiveness of God. You deny the fact that can forget, uh, forgive. You're denying the concept of repentance. So don't tell me to stay on topic because everything is on topic. Who introduced this poem? Uh, I think uh, you did not even believe yourself, uh, Doctor. Uh, I, I guess I could tell you, Brother Costa, you're my brother in humanity. Uh, you did not believe yourself actually when you were saying that uh, I said uh, tons of, of sons of gods in the Quran. You, you sure know that I misspoke, you know. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the tongue just utters. I meant in the, in the Old Testament. That's what I meant. Uh, and when I said the Father, I'm going to the God, my Father, and your Father, I was honest in conveying the text to you. I was citing the text. But I don't believe that. You, you need to understand the concept of God, Dr. Costa. Uh, he's not a human being. He's not a spirit either. God has a divine essence. No one there can even comprehend and reach the greatness of that divine essence. And that divine essence is above the throne. The Prophet, peace be upon him, our messenger, told us, do not reflect upon God, upon the essence of God, rather reflect upon some of the things that he created. You know, the throne, Dr. Costa, the throne where, where God resides, rose above it, you know, the heavens and the earth and the whatever in the heavens and the earth including you and me are like a ring in a desert if you compare the throne with the heavens and the earth including you and me is like a ring in a boundless desert so this is the throne what about God now you bring in that great divine essence into a womb of a mother, of a, of, of a woman, even if, it, if she is a chaste woman, like Mary, like Maryam. Okay, I'm staying on the subject here. And you making him spend there some years eating blood, or drinking blood, coming out of the womb, and simply being beaten up and placed on the cross for your own sins, Dr. Costa? I mean, uh, come on, this is the top of the line. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, maybe I'm abusive to say this, but I really believe that this is very selfish that you bring God with his divine essence from the throne and you kill him, nail him to the cross for your sins? I want to ask you a straightforward question, Dr. Costa, and I would like to get an answer from you, please. Who was on the cross? Jesus the God or Jesus the human? Which one? If Jesus the God, then you killed God. And if now, I, again, I'm going to convey the text to you. This does not mean that I believe he was crucified. When he said, Ela, Ela, Allah, Allah, why are you forsaking me? To whom he was talking to? You tell me, Dr. Costa. Okay, if, if, if Jesus the human was crucified, I'm sorry, this will go against the Gentile theology. Because the dogma of crucifixion and the atonement that God has to be killed for... for that's what Martha and, and that theology that he... Uh, uh, St. Paul imported from the pagan religions and he promoted out there because of crime with the Roman Empire. You see, when, when, when power and re religious scholars sit together, they corrupt the religion and was the top of the line, the Council of Nicaea, when they sat out there the year 321 and they canceled that same gospel. Where you said Muhammad imported you have one minute, Sheikh. the story of Jesus speaking in the, uh, uh, in the cradle from the gospel of, of Thomas. Huh? Why did they cancel out that gospel? Even though, why did they cancel out the gospel of, of, of Peter? Why it's not there? Huh? Because it does not rhyme with the Gentile theology. So please, two things here, Dr. Costa, and I have all respect for you. And I'm sorry 
uh, you know, I'm sounding uh, a little bit, um, uh, it's, it's my bad, I should come down a little bit. I like your calmness, so please forgive me. Who was on the cross, Dr. Costa? I'm going to ask this in a very calm manner. Jesus the human or Jesus the God? Thank you. Dr. Costa, you have five minutes to rebuttal. Thank you, Sheikh Kareem. I'm really enjoying our conversation. And, um, and so I'm honored to, to talk with you about this and, and to share it with you. Now, repentance and forgiveness is so important in the Bible. Uh, this is something that is central to the Bible. And so to, to uh, um, a state that this is not important in Christianity is simply not true. That is part and parcel of the atonement, the concept of sacrifice. Let me just uh, say something. When you were quoting John 20, you said, I'm conveying the text to you in honesty, but I really don't believe it. And Brother Kareem, how are we supposed to communicate with each other honestly if we don't respect each other's scriptures? You see, the problem here is this. I could say to you, well, I'm reading the Quran, and uh, I don't believe the Quran. I'm just going to use it for my own advantage. I think it behooves us as, as creatures of God, as brothers in Adam, to look at our scriptures honestly. So to quote the New Testament, it's saying, I believe it on one hand and then discount John 20, on the other hand, is disingenuous at best. The other thing is that um, you're forgetting the fact that the concept of sacrifice and atonement is central to the Torah. If you read Leviticus and Numbers, you will notice that God laid down laws and legislation concerning sacrifices, sin offerings, guilt offerings, peace offerings, and so forth. This is so important. The Quran knows nothing about this. The Quran doesn't even look at this. This is something alien to the Quran. And I'm asking you to consider the fact that as a Jew, this was central to Jesus. This is the background to Jesus' sacrifice. When Jesus says that the Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many, when Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples, he said that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is to be shed for many for the forgiveness of their sins. And so it's important to realize that Jesus consciously was aware of his death. He said that he had come to give his life as a ransom. And once again, this is an issue that is undisputable in historical studies. And so I don't think you've shown us any reason to deny the crucifixion or the death of Jesus. You simply have not shown it. You've just asserted that the Quran says so and you move on. Um, the other uh, question you asked, well, who died on the cross? Was it, was it God or man? Well, Jesus of Nazareth was the incarnate one. He was the eternal word made flesh. He was God in human flesh. Jesus had two natures. He's one person with two natures. If I can compare it to something, I can compare it to your view of the Quran. You believe that the Quran is the eternal word of Allah, the Kalimat Allah, and you believe that that eternal Quran was sent down, Tanzil, it was sent down and revealed to Muhammad through Jibreel, the angel. And that Quran was written down, and it became a written text. Now, if I were to take the Quran and I was to burn the Quran, have I destroyed the word of Allah? Well, you would say, well, of course not, because the word of Allah is eternal. You cannot destroy it. You can destroy the written pages, but you cannot destroy the eternal word that is the Quran. Christians believe that Jesus was the eternal word made flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not his divinity that died. It was his humanity. That's why Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He gave his spirit up. And so it was his perfect humanity that Jesus gave up for us on the cross. When Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabakani, from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was conversing with the Father. And the concept of God being Father is not foreign to Judaism. It is central to Judaism that Jesus considered and understood God to be the Father of his people. And so for the Son of God to communicate with the uh, Father is, is totally acceptable. Of course he was addressing One minute, Father. Dr. Costa. Now, why did the church not accept the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas? Very simple, Brother Kareem. Because they came in the second century. Peter did not write that text. Peter died in the year 66 AD, and Thomas died not long after that. So uh, those Gospels are spurious, they're apocryphal, they were not written by the Apostles, they are late, and that's why the early church rejected them. And so uh, I hope that has helped in some way, but the Apostle Paul was not promoting pagan religion, brother. The Apostle Paul was a faithful Jew. What he taught is based on the Old Testament and in the Jewish writings. And hopefully we can communicate by email, and I could share this with you. I can give you the source materials 
to back this up. So I'm not just saying this, brother. I'm willing to show you the evidence for you to check it out for yourself. Let's use even balances, as the Quran says. Let's be honest with each other and fair with each other. Thank you. Sheikh Kareem, three minutes, sir. Uh, uh, Brother Costa, um, I apologize if I give you the impression that I dis I'm disrespectful of, of, of your literature. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm simply, uh, you see, I think we need to come to terms that Christianity and Islam were essentially uh, the same religion, really. Uh, except for the different theology which uh, St. Paul uh, introduced into the religion. Uh, so I'm disagreeing with that, and a Muslim will never accept that. You need to understand that. And uh, when I started the debate, I told you this is actually a, a belief matter. That, uh, and you know what the, the concept of belief, what, what is the definition of belief is, uh, Dr. Costa? Uh, is believing without any shadow of doubt. If there is shock that goes out there, so I will not, uh, in, in my life, because that would nullify my Islam, accept the original sin, accept... So I'm really, when, when I spoke about it, it's because of my passion. But in no way I'm showing disrespect uh, to your um, uh, literature. And, and I should uh, maybe uh, reflect uh, my intention uh, better and I apologize for that. Um, secondly, I would love to exchange my email with you. I would show you the names of 15 groups who existed right there, not a thousand miles away, not 600 years later, I will show you the names of 16, 15 groups, I'm sorry, 15 groups, one five, so I'm not misquoting myself here. You see, if, if you lie, you have to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, have a good memory. Who stood against that theology? I will show, I will send it to you by email, their names, and. I will show you uh, the, 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 the Gospel of Peter, and I will show the Gospel of Thomas, Barnaba, and all of these. Um, I will show you the evidence that the, before Islam, there were uh, people who uh, did not believe that Jesus was One crucified. Minute, Rather, uh, uh, they believed in the uh, uh, theory of substitution. And I think we, we should allow, we should, we should we still have another 25 minutes. Uh, and I think I'm going to leave all of this and I'm going to go into my Quran and explain to you and the viewers what happened that day, what happened that night. Because we have a scenario there that is uh, written in our uh, scripture and I think the viewers deserve that. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you know what happened yourself because you're really basing all your theology on conjuncture like the Quran says. Uh, you, you know, even if you check and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not in, in any way disrespecting your literature, your gospel, your New Testament. If you go through the four gospels, you will find conflicting uh, accounts of the event of the alleged crucifixion of Jesus. Why don't, let us share your aspect. You know, we're talking about crucifixion and I'm going to second what Chris said. Let's stay on subject. Let, uh, let's uh, show us what happened that day. And I will show you what happened that day according to the Quran. And we can take it from there. So we're not repeating ourselves. Dr. Costa, you have three minutes. Let me just say that uh, I appreciate your, your honesty, sir, and I, I don't take any offense to uh, what you have said. So what happened on that day? It's very simple. Jesus died. He was buried, and on the following Sunday, he was raised from the dead, and he was vindicated as the Savior and the Son of God. And that is what gives us hope in this world, that we can know we have our sins forgiven. We have a living Savior who conquered the grave, who conquered death. Now, let's talk about, uh, the Quran says that those who dispute the death of Jesus are full of conjectures. Well, let's see who's full of conjectures. Christians have always admitted that Jesus died. There's no conjecture there. But what does uh, people like uh, my good friend Shabir Ali believe that Jesus was crucified? He was not killed on the cross, but he was nailed to the cross. And, uh, and Shabir Ali is a good friend of mine and a very respected Muslim apologist. So he does believe the crucifixion happened. He just doesn't believe Jesus died. What about Ibn Kathir, the great commentator on the Quran? Ibn Kathir says this, he points out, dealing with Surah 355, where it talks about uh, Jesus, um, it uses the, uh, the Arabic word, uh, mutawafika, I will take you to me, could also be translated, I will take you or uh, cause you to die. It's used 25 other times in the Arabic of the Quran to mean death. Well, this is what Ibn Kathir says. This is in his uh, Tafsir al-Quran, Volume 1, Part 2, pages 27 to 28. He says this, Ibn Kathir said, narrated Ali ibn Abi Talha, narrated Ibn Abbas, the meaning of take you to me, mutawafika, is to let you die. He also said, narrated Muhammad ibn Ashaq, narrated Allah, let him die, 
for three hours, then raised him. Again, he said, narrated Ibn Ashaq, Christians claimed that Allah let him die for seven hours, then he brought him to life again. Again, narrated Ishaq ibn Bashar, narrated Idris, narrated Wab, Allah One minute, let him Dr. Costa. for three days and then raised him up. That's Ibn Kathir, the respected commentator. So we know what happened to Jesus. Who is full of conjectures? Well, Muslims are full of conjectures. Shabir thinks Jesus was crucified. Ibn Kathir shows a number of Muslims who believe Jesus died and then was raised after three days or another one after seven days. And so, again, we have to ask the question, folks, who is it that is full of conjectures here? Why is it Ismailis, who are not Sunnis, believe in the crucifixion and death of Jesus and so forth? So we have to deal with Surah 355. We have to deal with the fact that um, Surah 933, we have to deal with Surah 5117, where it uses this word that means to cause to die. In some English translations, have interpreted and translated that verb to mean to die. So the death of Jesus is not even mentioned in Hadith al-Bukhari al-Muslim. Why is it not even mentioned in the most authentic Hadith? There is something awry here. Okay, Sheikh, you have six minutes to respond. Go ahead. You really refuted yourself, uh, Dr. Costa. You said the death of Jesus was not quoted in any authentic... Look at this, you really saved my time and energy in any authentic hadith. But meanwhile, you spend two to three minutes quoting Ibn Ishaq and quoting all these chain of transmitters. Uh, we, we need to understand this, Dr. Costa. Once it comes to the science of hadith, you are not well versed with it. I, I can tell right here. And I'm sorry, I, I take, you know, I, I'm not being offensive here. But when you say Ibn Kathir said Muhammad Ishaq, this is interrupted chain. First of all, when you talk about Ibn Abbas, we have five chain of transmitters. Only two of them are authentic. And listen, I'm not, I can send you the evidence for that. I'm not fooling you. I'm, I'm not fooling the viewers. Only two of these chain of transmitters are authentic. Ibn Kathir are, is filled, filled with weak transmissions. And for you to quote from Ibn Kathir, you have to bring the view of the experts of the hadith who authenticated his chain or not. So you cannot use these names and give the impression to the people out there. I, I really, you know, was expecting you to tell me what happened according to your books and leave that to me. I was going to say it and you could refute me, but you chose to tell me what happened in the scripture in one minute, even though it would take a long time. Let me ask you this, Dr. Kassa. Yeah. Was Jesus a well-known character in the uh, Jewish community? He was. He exercised miracles. He was very famous. Tell me, why would they need somebody to identify him? Why? Why would they need somebody to identify him? I, you know, I'm talking about Judith, right? The one who uh, uh, took some money for, to, to, to do the job, and he regretted that uh, later on. Uh, why? He was a known person. Why would the chief of the uh, disciples, I don't know, the Rais al-Kahana, that's how I know him in, in Arabic, would ask him, are you uh, the name of God? Je Why? Why? Uh, Jesus used to spend 40 days and 40 nights without food and water. And why when he was on the cross? Again, don't say that. I'm like I said, there are sons of gods and there are fathers. Uh, this is blasphemous for me to say that. And you know that. Uh, so when I say Jesus on the cross, he begged them for something to drink, for a drink. Why would Jesus need to do that to humiliate himself? Why? Why don't you answer these questions? Huh? Uh, who, who was he talking to? Uh, tell me really what happened according to your gospel. And I will take the initiative in explaining to you what happened according to the Quran. But here you are. You took one minute. Let me ask you this, Dr. Costa, and please help me out here. Why did God have to do this? Take a man who was without a sin, according to you, and according to us too. Actually, we believe we have a famous hadith, Fi Sahih al-Bukhari, one of these so authentic hadith, uh, hadith al-Shafa'ah, the hadith of intercession, that Jesus will not even mention a sin. Why would he take somebody who is sinless in order to kill him for the sins of the others? Why would he do that? Where is the justice that you're talking about? Tayyip. You're saying God is so merciful to us? Couldn't he be merciful to his own son? Come on. 
They tell you charity begins at home, Dr. Khan. I, I think this, this is the type of things you need to bring up. But don't quote some weak hadith out there that we know it. You see, for you to bring any account for Ibn Kathir, you have to, to say that. Sahaha al Albani was authenticated by Al Albani. Sahaha ibn Shakir. Sahaha ibn Asakir. Sahaha al Qadi Ayat was authenticated. Not every hadith in Sahih al Bukhari is. In, 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 uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in uh, Tafsir ibn Kathir. Uh, that, that the commentary on the Quran is authentic, Dr. Kasta. We know this. You, you, don't, you don't quote this uh, uh, chain of transmitters. Uh, please tell us what happened and allow me to tell you what happened according to the Quran. Our time is running out. I think we still have 15 minutes. Come on, let's get the viewers to enjoy this. Tell us what happened that day in detail. Don't just tell me that he was taken on the cross. What happened? Tell me the story. Why he was asked that question, are you Jesus? Why did they need somebody to identify him? And why don't you quote the three Anajil, the three Gospels, narrating the story and, and, and tell the, 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 the viewers the discrepancies amongst them? And leave the account of the Quran. I memorize the Quran. I, I will tell it to you. I will tell you what happened exactly that day. And by the way, I have high regard for Shabir Ali, brother Shabir Ali. And I watched uh, some of your debates with him, and I respect him highly. He's a good, beautiful brother that I love him for the sake of Allah. He, uh, he cannot imagine. I have I harbor all type of love. One minute, him, but I disagree with him totally regarding his approach that Jesus was even put to the cross. I disagree with with him totally because that is not something that was established by the scholars. You see something about Islam, Doctor Casta. Uh, that we have that beautiful saying that says, "Kullu yuqhadu min huwa yurad illa Rasulullah." Everyone, he can tell him no. He can tell him no. Why? Because we follow the Quran and the Sunnah. And praise be to God. He preserved the Quran and the Sunnah to us. And we can verify and find out which one is authentic, which one. What they are using is, you know, interpretation, their own personal interpretation. We could say no to it as long as we have it. We have an authentic text. Ibn, Ibn Kathir, the one that you're quoting, authenticated the text that Jesus' resemblance was thrown on one of his disciples. And that's what I'm going to share with you. But please tell us the account of the, the Gospels, please. Thank you. Dr. Castro, go ahead, six minutes. Yeah, uh, Brother Kareem, I've been saying this over and over again. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth came into the world. He said he would come to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus had a last supper with his disciples. He was betrayed by one of his disciples. Jesus was arrested. Jesus was put on the trial. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was buried. And then Jesus was raised again. It's just that simple. The Gospels all concur on that point. Uh, the letters of the New Testament concur on that point. And so I've told you what it says. I, uh, you keep asking uh, for this, but I keep telling you that's what it says. Well, I never said, I, when we're talking about the Hadith, I said Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim do not mention the death of Jesus and the crucifixion. I'm not talking about all the other Hadith. I'm talking about the two main uh, Sahih Hadith that are considered the most reliable. You didn't mention there's a third one, and that is Sunan Abu Dawood, which is also considered uh, authentic uh, in third place after Bukhari and uh, Muslim. Uh, was Jesus well known in the Jewish community? Well, he was well known, but Jesus was not some famous aristocrat from Jerusalem. Jesus was a humble carpenter from Nazareth. And um, he was put under trial under Caiaphas. That is in the account as well. Jesus was put under trial. Um, then you ask the question about um, why did God have to do this? You know why he had to do it, uh, Brother Kareem? Because God loved us so much that he sent his son into the world to show us that his love was sacrificial. Jesus Christ was the most selfless person who ever lived. He gave his life up as a ransom. If I give my life for you, brother, if you are in danger of being killed by a car or by an assailant with a rifle and I got on the way and I gave my life, you would be in, in gratitude towards me for that. Jesus did that for us on a cosmic scale in giving his life for us. So the Gospels are clear. This is an issue, again, that is not under dispute. Why did Jesus ask for a drink on the cross to fulfill the prophecies? Read Psalm 22, brother, where it says, they gave me vinegar to drink. They pierced my hands and my feet. They parted my garments and they cast lots for my garments. He was fulfilling the prophecy of the suffering servant in Psalm 22 in the Zabor of David. Now, you also asked the question about discrepancies. The Gospels are full of discrepancies. Now, discrepancies are not contradictions. The Quran talks about the story of Moses in eight different ways. 
The Quran talks about the story of the angels and Iblis bowing down to Adam and Iblis refuses to bow down. And that story is given in different versions, different accounts, and the words are different. But are you going to charge the Quran with being unacceptable because the accounts do not agree, that they also differ? I don't think you would. Now, the justice of God, I think in Islam, the justice of God is not met because you talk about Al-Rahmin, that he is the merciful, the compassionate. But brother, where's the justice of Allah? In the Bible, at the cross, the justice of God for sin is met. God shows his mercy and his justice is met at the cross. A penalty was paid at the cross. But in Islam, where is the justice of Allah? Allah just forgives sins and off you go. And then you commit another sin and you just come back and he just forgives you. But where's the justice? Where is the law of Allah here? In the Bible, we have the law of God. We have the Ten Commandments. And when we break that law, we become sinners, and we become debtors to that law. And that is why God sent his son into the world. So the death of Jesus, Jesus understood his death to be an atonement for sin. And that's why at the Last Supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is to be shed for the remission and forgiveness of sins. And even after his resurrection, he said that it was meant for the Messiah to suffer and to die and to rise again the third day. So, Brother Kareem, if you go to the first century documents, which every New Testament scholar, secular scholar agrees are the New Testament texts that deal with the historical Jesus, it's clearly spelled out there. Jesus did give his life. But here's the good news. God raised Jesus from the dead. And by raising him from the dead, God vindicated him. And so uh, you've admitted that you disagree with Brother Shabir, but who has conjectures here? Who's full of conjectures? The Christians believe Jesus died. Who's the one who says he was crucified? No, he wasn't. He died for three hours. He was raised. He died for seven hours. He was raised. Who has conjectures? It's not the Christians, Brother Kareem. It's the Muslims. And you have to deal with that reality. Thank you. Before we move on with our debate, we're going to go to the phones in just a bit. But before we even do that, we're going to go ahead and cut to a one-minute break. We want you to stay tuned. Um, and we get back, we'll go to the phones. You're watching the Trinity Channel. Stay tuned, and we'll be back in just a moment. Watch ABN on your TV. With the Chromecast stick, you can simply connect your phone to the television to watch shows. Download the ABN Sat app and click on the Chromecast button. Need help installing? Contact us at 248-416-1300. Live Arabic debate between Shant and Sheikh Basim al shara The topic will be a cry from the furnace of religion. The debate will be held on Monday, March 7th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. GMT Time. For more information, please call the numbers on the screen or visit our website at abnsad.com. You can now watch ABN in the Trinity channel on your iPhone and iPad. Search for ABN Sat in the App Store. You can watch all the following channels. The Arabic channel, the English Trinity channel, the Worship channel, the Surath channel, the Kurdish channel, the al Qadus channel, the prayer channel, and a special channel for Europe and the Middle East. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. To our viewers all over the world, you can watch us by satellite through the following frequencies. For North America and Canada, please join us on the Galaxy 19 satellite, frequency 11966 horizontal. For Europe and Middle East, Join us on the Hotbird satellite, frequency 12111 vertical. For Australia and New Zealand, please join us on the Optus 2 satellite, frequency 12546 vertical. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. And you're watching the Trinity Channel. My name is Chris Palmer and I'm your debate moderator. If you're just joining us this evening, we're discussing the crucifixion of Jesus, fact or fiction. We're delighted to have our guest, Sheikh Kareem, as well as Dr. Costa. In our debate, this is the point where we want to go to the phones. If you've been listening for the last hour and 20 minutes, 
or maybe you're just tuning in, you have questions for the Sheikh, perhaps you have questions for Dr. Costa, there's a number that's at the bottom of your screen. I want you to call that. I want to invite you right now to call that number, pick up the phone. Perhaps you have a question about the crucifixion of Jesus. We have Sheikh Kareem and we have Dr. Costa here. They are happy to answer your questions. We have a caller already lined up. We have Jay. Uh, we want to go to the phones. Jay, are you there with us? Can you hear us? Hi, yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we're, we can hear you very well. Who's your question for? Okay. I have a question for the Sheikh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, in your rebuttal session, you quoted Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 19, where you stated that Jesus said that where it's to keep the law, uh, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. <clears throat> so my question for you is, that since you accept what Matthew here says about Jesus, in terms of you using that as a statement to justify what Muslims believe, then how can you, on the same hand, reject what Matthew says when he says Jesus clearly said that he came to be killed and raised on the day? Can I answer? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Jay, thank you very much for your question. Um, Listen to this verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the table which is really uh, the, 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 the focal uh, point of this uh, uh, chapter, chapter 5, is really Prophet Jesus. Allah says in the Quran, يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولُنَا يُبَيِّنُ لَكُمْ كَثِيرًا مِمَّا كُنْتُمْ تُخْفُونَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ O people of the book, there come to you our messenger, revealing to you things that you used to conceal. Which is what the, 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 the Pauline theology, that, that this is wrong, the, 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 the crucifixion and all. Uh, like I, I told you uh, during my rebuttal session, that this is the wisdom why a resemblance of Jesus was thrown on one of his disciples. And I was, given, I was not given the opportunity to uh, express that. Uh, we believe that when the Romans and the Jews came to arrest Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, to boot him to the cross, Jesus stood up, and this is Athar Abdullah ibn Abbas. This is one of the chain of transmitters, Dr. Kasta, uh, which is authentic, and Ibn Kathir himself authenticated it. He asked his disciples, who would like to be my companion in paradise and has his resemblance, my resemblance thrown in him, and he is the one who was put to the cross. Now, some of you will say, why God has to come up with that trick? And you, you, you go after that word mockery and mock and all of this. Simply because if this scene was not executed, the Romans would assume that the disciples of Jesus, his students, those who lived with him, were the reason for him to run away. They are not going to believe that Jesus was raised up. You see, we believe that Jesus was raised up was after he was put to sleep. And this is what is meant by the word mutawafika, Dr. Kasta, that, the one that you quoted. That I'm going to put you to sleep and then I'm going to raise you up, body and soul. Would Jesus have been raised up without the resemblance being thrown on one of his disciples? The Romans would have executed all his disciples. And they would not have taught the people the true teachings of Jesus, which would have which did stand against the Pauline theology for years until uh, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, and this is the will of Allah. It was some leftover after that, even in individuals. So, uh, when we, and this is what I, what I meant, Jay, when I was explaining myself, that there is a Jewish theology. Uh, what I mean by Jewish theology, the teachings of Jesus that was promoted by his disciples after being spared because of the fact that one of them sacrificed himself on the cross uh, in return. Take you have one minute, sir. Reward of a martyr. And this is what I'm quoting to you. I'm quoting from Matthew. And this is the Jewish theology. But I will not agree with the Gentile theology because I, I, I said, and I'm going to close here, Chris. I know I, I talk long, but I'm going to, this is my last statement. Look at this. Look at this now. The first books which were inserted into the New Testament, and please, Dr. Costa, refute me if I'm wrong, are the 14 letters of Paul. Now, this came first. All the so-called writers of the other books were influenced already by these distorted concepts that were uh, introduced because of St. Paul. 
So when I say Matthew this, I'm, I'm really referring to what condone uh, this and uh, condone who Jesus according to Islam and Jews. Okay, I stop. I, I stop. Sorry about that. I took long. Sorry. Dr. Kasta, you're free to rebuttal. Okay. Uh, well, the problem here is uh, Brother Kareem did not respond to the questioner. He was saying, why do you quote Matthew 5:17 uh, to, to 20 and, and accept that but not accept the uh, narratives of the crucifixion? Well, it's very simple. This is a major problem with our, with our Muslim friends, and that is they're very selective. They selectively cherry-pick which passages they want, which they don't. So the rule is, if it agrees with the Quran, it's true. If it doesn't agree with the Quran, it's false. And that is, again, inconsistent. And as my good friend James White uh, always points out, the sign of a failed argument is always an inconsistent argument. A couple of things I just wanted to mention as well, and that is, notice uh, now Ibn Kathir is not reliable. When I quote him, he wasn't reliable, but now he's reliable. And the other interesting thing is this idea of casting the resemblance. That is not in uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. This comes much later. And once again, who was it? Was it Judas Iscariot? Was it Simon of Cyrene? Was it a spy? And notice again, who has all the conjectures? It's not the Christians. It's actually the Muslims who have all this conjecture. And so this is the major problem. And this is where I think our Muslim friends have to um, be consistent. If you want us to quote the Quran in context and consistently, we ask you to also respect the Bible. Now, Matthew was written to the Jews, so I don't know where uh, this Gentile theology thing, this idea of a Gentile theology is, is, I've never heard of it in my studies or in my research. This is the first time I'm hearing a Gentile theology tonight. But uh, the Apostle Paul was not a Gentile. He was a Jew who was sent to the Gentiles with the gospel of Jesus. Um, and so... In terms of the canonization of the Bible, the earliest uh, documents we have are the letters of Paul. There's no doubt about that. But we also have James as an early letter uh, in the New Testament. But that's not the issue. The issue here is if what uh, Brother Kareem is saying is true, uh, then we would expect hordes of scholars and historians to agree with him. But the fact of the matter is they don't. And so what I don't understand is we have first century documents that come from the time of Jesus. Eyewitnesses, yes. Luke 1, 1 to 4 says, the one minute. Eyewitnesses. John was one of those eyewitnesses. They tell us that Jesus died. Jesus himself said he will come to give his life as a ransom for many. The problem is Brother Kareem does not believe what Jesus says in the Gospels. And that's most unfortunate because he simply has with, uh, just dismissed the Gospels out of hand simply because they don't agree with his already presuppositional, preconceived idea that the Quran is the measuring rod. And that is most unfortunate because we can't dialogue this way. We're going to go ahead and go back to the phones. Before we do that, I just want to say uh, to our opponents to uh, let's keep now our answers to one minute and we'll go back and forth. We have Akil. Akil, are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm here. How are you? Good. Welcome to the Trinity Channel. Who is your question for this evening? Um, my question is to Dr. Kasta. Salam alaikum wa Okay, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Costa, I wanted to ask you a question about Mary, Are they said Um When Mary gave birth to Jesus, and they, thought, uh, they realized she didn't have a uh, husband, and it wasn't from Joseph, the Jewish law for adultery or fornication was to be punished, was to be stoned to death, or, you know, that was a punishment. How did Mary get absolved of bringing her child without having a husband? What was, what was the, um, the venue by which she was absolved and wasn't punished by death? according to Jewish law, if it wasn't for the testimony of Jesus, at least now absolving her of the uh, idea of adultery or fornication. Question. Uh, under, his, under the Jewish law, in order to show adultery, uh, you have to provide witnesses, and you also have to provide both parties. So you can't just accuse an adulteress uh, by herself or an adulterer by himself. You need both to be present, according to the Mosaic law. Now, we're told in the Gospel of Matthew that Joseph was a righteous man and that he did not want to put Mary to uh, public shame. And so while he was preparing to put her away or divorce her or break the engagement, he was told by angelic revelation that the child in her womb was by the Holy Spirit, that this was a divine miracle that she had conceived. Now, we do know from the Gospel accounts, and we know this from the Jewish Talmud, uh, Jesus was spurned by the Jews. They considered him illegitimate. Uh, the Talmud makes uh, some insulting remarks about him. The Quran knows about this in Surah 4, 156, about the calumny that they have raised against Mary and so forth. So 
Joseph did not expose her. He was willing to take her as his wife from the revelation that the child that she bore or was going to bear was the Messiah, Jesus himself. Thank you, and Dr. So Costa. Joseph's responsibility not to expose her. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sheikh, go ahead. You have one minute. Uh, then, well, more than that. He talked more than that, Chris, okay? The narrative of the Quran is more authentic, Dr. Costa. The narrative of the Quran tells us that Jesus the baby spoke in infancy. This is a miracle. This is what credit your, uh, I mean, I mean uh, the theology that uh, St. Paul introduced, that he is divine or something. Uh, but why it was also canceled out from the revelation, from uh, the true gospel, from the biography of Jesus, uh, because simply what he said. Imagine the first words that came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Inni Abdullah, I'm the slave of Allah. Atani al kitab, he given me the book, the, the Injil. And what, this is what he said. He said, I quoted the verse to you that I am a prophet. He made me blessed wherever I am. So that would make more sense than that, you know, Joseph and he wanted to, and that four things for, you know, for, uh, for witnesses. And we want to go ahead and ask you to finish up the answer sense. so we can get to other uh, callers. One here. last thing about being selective. You are yourself being selective, Dr. Costa. You're selective from the Quran. You're selective from the gospel. I just shared with you some text that we Jesus said, I'm a Sheikh, We appreciate, uh, yeah. we just got to quickly move forward. We have on the line, Pantier, are you there? Hello? Pantia, are you there? Uh, okay, go ahead with your question. Jacob, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Jacob, thank you for calling in tonight. Who is your question for? Um, the Sheik. Okay, what's your question? Uh, I had a question regarding the uh, Pauline uh, Gentile theology, but I have a, since that was already discussed earlier, I have a follow up question. Um, on Jesus fulfilling the, the, the Jewish prophecy, and how does he account for the Dead Sea Scrolls, which confirm those prophecies being you know, written before Christ, and Christ fulfilling those prophecies? Thank, thank you, Jacob. Sheikh, did you understand the question? Yeah, Jacob, we don't, we don't know what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I hope the, uh, uh, the, the, the Church and, and the Vatican can reveal that information to us. It's, it's actually out there that says that Muhammad is the messenger and you guys are supposed to follow him. That's what we know written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But what was revealed to you, uh, what was released to you, is, is something that, uh, uh, you know, really... Uh, it's like every year you meet into somewhere in Florida and you add uh, Gospels and you cancel out Gospels. Um, homosexuality was not allowed into the religion, now it's okay. Um, because we're losing members, uh, uh, divorce was not okay. Now it's okay. Uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 typically the council the council of Nicaea uh, uh, pattern uh, where you uh, you upgrade and you 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 adjust the religion to uh, not to lose the crowd. You know, that's not what religion was supposed to be. Religion is not there to be stretched out for people to be comfortable with. No, you stretch yourself well, out. Dr. For we want to give Dr. Costa an opportunity. As our callers are continuing to call in, Dr. Costa? That is, is absolutely false. We do know what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They've been translated uh, into English in various languages. They're available online. You can see the Dead Sea Scrolls online now. So it's complete error to say we don't know. We know what's in them. They were written by the Essenes. They were a Jewish, Jewish sectarian group. Very important documents. They're a thousand years earlier than the oldest Old Testament manuscript we had. And they verify the Old Testament uh, prophecies and transmission. Now, he said something about the true gospel of Jesus. You know, the Quran Surah 5 says, Let the Akhal Injil, the people of the gospel, judge by what Allah has revealed in the Injil. So the Quran tells me as a Christian to go and judge by what Allah has revealed in the Injil, wherein is guidance and light. I'm doing what Allah said. When I go to the Injil, we know what the Injil looked like. So Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus are from 325 A.D., before Muhammad, and it looks exactly like our New Testament today. So the New Testament we have today contradicts the Quran. Okay, we want to go back to the phones. We have Mike and Danny. Are you there, Mike and Danny? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, welcome to the Trinity Channel. Thank you for calling in. Who is your question for? Uh, my question is for the Sheikh. Okay. And uh, uh, what I wanted to say was, uh, even if the Bible was corrupt, 
and uh, somebody had to come correct it. Why would it be Muhammad when uh, he never performed no miracles? And according to scholar uh, Jay Smith, the Quran was co constructed in at least the 9th century, so there's nothing miraculous about it. So even if somebody was supposed to come and correct it, why should I believe this man and not Joseph Smith who came later on? Thanks. Okay, thank you for your question. Sheik, did you understand? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, I think it's, it's not correct, Mike, right. to say that the Quran doesn't... Uh, Muhammad never, never exercised any miracles. Uh, I can... Uh, say, just, I, I hope, you, you know, uh, you can get my email from... I can send you a lot of miracles uh, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, exercised in front of his companions. Uh, at one stage, they didn't have food when they would, were digging the trench, and Dr. Costa can help me with that, Hadith Jabir for Bukhari, uh, that uh, he fed a thousand people, like the table that was brought down for Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and he fed his disciples. So it's, it's, it's an accurate. Uh, the Quran also, the, if, if you go through, uh, why would, the, I want to ask you a question. Why would the Quran, go and check chapter 13 in the Quran, why would the Quran call the ruler of Egypt a king during the time of Joseph? Uh, Prophet Joseph, and a Pharaoh during the time Prophet Moses. Huh? Uh, look at the uh, mummy of Ramesses II and the work that was done on it. It was established that uh, he is the, 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 the Pharaoh who challenged Prophet Musa. Uh, uh, Allah said in the Quran that I will expose your body to the rest of the Go ahead and give uh, Dr. Costa a chance to respond. Yeah, well, a Brother Kareem has just contradicted the Quran. The Quran says Muhammad performed no signs, no miracles. He was only a warner to the people. It's the Hadith of Bukhari that comes up with these stories, and these stories come 200 years after Muhammad and are not reliable in that time uh, period, simply because the Quran says he did not perform any miracles and so forth. Um, so the, the, the questioner made an excellent point. Why should I believe Muhammad? Why not believe Baha'u'llah, who started the Baha'i faith? Why not believe Joseph Smith, uh, who started the Mormon faith? Uh, why not believe Charles Russell, who started the Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth? Why Muhammad? So there's a lot of presuppositions going on here, and our brother Kareem is simply looking at everything. He's put on his Islamic lenses. He's looking and interpreting everything through the lenses of Islam. So no, Muhammad did not perform any miracles, not according to the Quran, and the Hadith has to fill in the gap because people were challenging him on that question. So the Hadith made him perform miracles like Jesus did. We want to go to the phone. Danny, are you there? Danny, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Who's your question uh, for, Danny? My question, yeah, my question is for the Sheikh. Um, why is it that the Quran um, contradicts uh, Moses in regards to atonement? As um, God told Moses that he had given um, Moses the blood upon the altar to make atonement for souls. But then Muhammad comes along thousands of years later saying that, or the Quran saying that you can be forgiven, that your sins can be overlooked without any atonement. Sheikh, did you understand the question? No, I did not. I'm can sorry. you repeat, Danny? Can you can you repeat that again for the Sheikh? Yeah, my, my my question was why is it that Muhammad contradicts Moses in regards to atonement? For instance, Moses said uh, that God had given him the blood upon the altar to make atonement for souls in the book of Levit Leviticus. But uh, Muhammad comes along thousands of years later saying that you can be forgiven without any atonement. Was that clearer, Sheikh? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you, Danny. That, that, he's refer, referring to Leviticus, uh, Leviticus, I'm sorry, 1711. And Dr. Costa knows that Jewish scholars would actually condemn uh, the interpretation of that text. Uh, the Quran actually, look, uh, uh, the son should not bear the iniquity of the father. And the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son. This is Ezekiel 1820, okay? In the Quran, uh, that burden, uh, you cannot, it's exactly the same thing. What gone astray here is the Pauline theology, which Dr. Costa, unfortunately, is advocating, which is totally contradictory to the teachings of Jesus. I'm standing for the teachings of Jesus. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what you're standing for, Dr. Costa, is the Pauline theology. Let me go back to the issue of miracles. Hopefully I can do this in 15 minutes. You need to understand for physical miracles Dr. to become have an opportunity to respond in to the this. eyes of the beholders, Dr. in the eyes of the beholders, go ahead and respond. That's why Sheikh, the we, have to, we have to move on with our question, Sheikh. Go ahead, okay. Dr. Costa. Well, I, don't think, I don't think the Sheikh answered the question, why does the Quran contradict Moses? Leviticus 17.11 says, I've given you the blood on the altar to make atonement. Uh, Jewish uh, scholars are not disputing that. The Talmud simply says that in the absence of the temple, 
we could pray right now, but the Jewish hope is that Messiah will come and rebuild the temple and reinstitute the sacrifice. That's the Jewish hope. Now, why does the Quran contradict Musa or Moses? It's very simple, folks. Muhammad did not know what the Torah said. Muhammad, according to Muslim tradition, was illiterate. He could not read. And it's very clear that the author of the Quran or the authors of the Quran were ignorant of what was in the Torah, what was ignorant, what was in the Injil, and so forth. This is why the uh, Quran cannot be the revelation of the Torah and the Zabur and the Injil because it, it simply contradicts it. And so uh, Muhammad had no clue what Moses taught about uh, atonement. Uh, we look at the Torah, atonement is extremely important. So why didn't he know? It's very simple. Muhammad did not know the Torah. He was ignorant of it. Okay, let's go to the phones. Karen, are you there? Yes, I am. Welcome to the Trinity Channel, Karen. Thank you for calling in this evening. Who is your question for? Uh, I have uh, one quick comment, if I may, and that's about the question as to why Jesus needed water on the cross. And uh, if you compare the fasting to the experience on the cross, Jesus was dying, he was bleeding to death, he was... Uh, exposed to the elements, he'd been scourged the uh, night before, I believe, and so uh, he was under tremendous physical stress. Totally different set of circumstances compared to the fast. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, my question is: uh, I, in my readings of the Quran, I have read that if you um, uh, follow or, or obey a list of four or five behaviors usually, you will be forgiven. Other people have explained to me that there will be an accounting, a strict weighing of the good versus the evil in a person's life. And so I'm wondering if uh, the two gentlemen can explain the concept of forgiveness in, uh, in Islam to me. Thank you. Karen, thank you for your question. Remember, one minute to answer this question. I'm sorry, Dr. Casta, and I'm sorry I have to use this time. Deuteronomy uh, 2, 30, 30 to 31. God hates human, human sacrifices. Who, come, who came up with the human sacrifice, that he sacrificed a human being? Just look into Deuteronomy 2, 12, 30 to 31. God rebuked the people, Moses and uh, the, 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 the Jews attacked, uh, because they are offering their sons to the gods. Who is doing this? Who's who's promoting that theology? So we're not promoting that theology. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the the name of the of the caller. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Simply, the concept of forgiveness in Islam is very simple. You believe in one God. You love that God with your heart. That's why when you say that Jesus sacrificed, you're shifting that love from God to. You're going to end up with contradictory. Who are you going to love more? You're going to end up committing polytheism, which is shirk. Everything begins with love. You're supposed to love God with your heart, Allah with your heart. If you have monotheism, if you have monotheism, which is there is no deity worthy of your submission, of your worship, except Allah, and any time that you sin, you ask for forgiveness, but if the sin engages okay, the right... We have to get to Dr. Costa because we have other right. people coming in. Dr. Costa, go ahead. Yes, what I would say uh, to that is the procedure of forgiveness is very clear. Right from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, God took two animals and killed them and clothed them with the, the skins of those animals. God taught the, the principle of atonement is seen in Abel's offering in Genesis 4. You see it in Abraham. Noah offered up sacrifice after the flood. The concept of atonement runs right through the Torah. And what that means is that a sinner cannot stand before a holy God. He cannot pay God for the debt that he owes. And so... A, a sacrifice, uh, an innocent victim takes that place. The Quran says no person with a burden can carry another's burden. The good news is Jesus didn't have the burden of sin, and so he could bear a sin. And it wasn't a human sacrifice. Jesus said in John 10, I lay down my life of my own accord. No man takes it from me. So Jesus willingly gave his life as a sacrifice, as a ransom. This isn't pagan sacrifice. You're not offering up uh, people, uh, virgin girls to the gods and so forth. Jesus willingly laid down his life for us, and that's God's love. You don't see that in the Quran. Okay, we have Linda. Linda, are you there? Linda, can you hear me? Linda, are you there? I'm waiting for our caller to call back.
Okay, go ahead, uh, Sheikh, you can go ahead and follow up with what Dr. Costa had to say. Dr. Smith, when I, I have one sentence just to complete my thought. Why do you cut it? That doesn't make any benefit, do any benefit to the, uh, you know, it, it doesn't do any benefit, you know, for the people. I mean, uh, there was one sentence to complete. So the concept of forgiveness in Islam, Allah is all forgiving. As long as you believe in him, the one deity, the one God, and any time that you commit a sin like Adam, he ate from the tree. You request forgiveness from God, he will forgive your sins. There is no question about it because he's merciful. Forgiveness is more beloved to him than punishment. Now, if the sin engages the rights of another human being, like if I wrong somebody, then I have to settle these injustices with them before I even ask for forgiveness for that uh, completion of the process of repentance. This is how it's done. This is how it was done all the time. But you making this exclusive to uh, a sacrifice, you bring in God from, the, cro uh, from the, uh, the throne, putting him on the cross. I mean, come on, why would you do that? For your own sins? Huh? You kill God for your, ins your own sins, Dr. Costa? I mean, okay, you believe that died. Right? We have, to, we have, a, we have a caller that's calling in. We have, Vadia, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Thank you for calling in tonight. Who is your question for? Uh, for Dr. Costa. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my question is just, well, so you say that God killed his sinless son to save us all. So that means that everyone's going to heaven. Um, so my question is, if there was a killer who says he's a Christian, and believes in the, crucifix the crucifixion of Jesus, does that mean his killing is justified because... Uh, he believes in the crucifixion of Jesus, and that he killed, he, you know, he died for all his sin, their sins. Um, and just the understanding, do you guys believe in hell or not? The end. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Costa. The answer, yes, we both believe in hell. <clears throat> and uh, yes, if, if, even if a murderer, uh, an adulterer, uh, were to repent of their sins and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, yes, their sins will be forgiven them. That is the great love of God, that God could take the most rebellious person and change their heart. And this is not a license to sin. This doesn't mean that the killer just gets off scot-free and then he can go on killing and do whatever he wants. That's not what the Bible says. Moses was a murderer in the Bible. Uh, David was a murderer in the Bible and an adulterer as well. And God forgave them. But you see, the justice of God has to be met. I'm hearing a lot of mercy here, but mercy means nothing if there's no justice. We have wronged a holy God. We have wronged the Almighty. We have sinned against the Almighty. And so, where is his justice? God has a moral law, and that moral law has to be kept, and the justice of that law has to be executed. You don't find that in Islam, and that's simply because sin is not a serious thing in Islam as it is in Christianity and Judaism. I want to give you one minute to respond. You are very conscious of time, so we have to end our show after the response. The formula of crucifixion is not a license to sin. Rather, it is an invitation to sin. It is an open invitation to sin. If you don't fear hell, this is an invitation. I know it's not a license to sin, that's what you're going to say, but it's an invitation to sin. You know, I'm going to use a good analogy that my best friend Shabir Ali used. Imagine a, an officer stopping somebody who's speeding, and then that officer would give him a ticket. Then he would say, listen, you know, my wife is pregnant. I'm running her to the hospital. He's going to give him a little ticket, but... Not three hundred, four hundred dollars. I, you know, maybe a hundred dollars. So it goes. That's where combined justice and mercy, consideration, because we are weak creation of God. That is the formula, that that that, that eligible formula that has been existing from time until Jesus. Paul came and just cancelled it out, and that's what we're debating about tonight. Right. Unfortunately, Sheikh, I want to say uh, a special thanks to Sheikh Kareem as well as Dr. Costa for a very spirited debate. Thank you for coming on and, and being part of the broadcast. Unfortunately, all of our time is up this evening. For those people that called in, thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. We want to remind you that immediately after this show, there's a follow-up show with Ismail Namir and Tony Garul. That show starts at 6 o'clock p.m. They'll be following up this debate, so we invite you to stay tuned and watch uh, the upcoming program. Thank you again to Sheikh Kareem. Thank you again, Dr. Costa. Thank you for coming on and being a part of this spirited debate. But once again, you're watching the Trinity Channel. If you have any questions, you can visit the website 
or call the phone number listed at the bottom of your screen. Stay tuned for our follow-up show, which is soon to follow. Have a good evening.